I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're diving into the transformative power of faith with an amazing author. Her name is Judy Chatham. She has written a powerful book that is called When Sunday Looks Like Tuesday, Growing a Strong Faith for Everyday Living. We will discover how Judy's journey can inspire you to build resilience and overcome life's trials with unwavering faith. We will learn the secrets of cultivating a strong spiritual foundation. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank the team at Authors Tranquility Press for helping us put her in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support authors like her by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing her remarkable book. The links are below the interview. Judy, great to see you here today on Spotlight. Good to see you. Yes. Wonderful to have you on the show. I enjoyed your book very, very much. When Sunday looks like Tuesday, what does that mean? That we should be as faithful and appreciative of God's blessings every day, not just Sunday? Yes, we really should. I, the reason I chose Tuesday was Tuesday was clinic day at our house for, for uh, uh, various reasons. And so that's why I chose it. And when you go to clinic day, you know, you can get any kind of information, <laughs> good or bad. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. A clinic day can be a day you dread, that's for sure. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your book and give us an overview of what it's about. Well, this is a, a, a an overview of uh, my experiences uh, as a guide for uh, all the people who are reading to, to apply to their own life. So I, sh I began by uh, showing how very uh, elementary, my beginning was, uh, my, my faith might have been based on a poem from high school or a song uh, that I'd heard on the radio, and I thought that would be sufficient, and then things started happening in my life, and I began to add different, different uh, things uh, that happened uh, to me and things that I learned, lessons I learned, and uh, I build all of this up so that we get to the end and when we get to the end, we have uh, my granddaughter being called to New York City to be uh, one of the nurses at uh, in New York City during the pandemic. Mm. And so then I send messages to her and it shows how my faith has grown through these messages. So I think that will uh, kind of give an idea. Um, but uh, it's yes, we've been through some hard times, haven't we, with the pandemic? For Absolutely. Sure. The pandemic was one uh, difficult time for sure. One, Some people didn't make it. Other people got oh. sick and everybody lived in fear. So yeah. tell us a little bit about how the, your faith shielded you during that difficult time. I, I relied heavily on the hymns of mm -hmm. the church, of the old time church. Uh, my grandmother was a... Uh, a pianist who was all over the county uh, area playing uh, the hymns. And mm -hmm. I went back and I used those as inspiration to for my daily living. Mm -hmm. I really, this was very important. We were, you know, we were not really gathering. We were not getting together with other people. So I was trying to find something at home that I had. And this is what I, uh, I show you in the, in the book, how I use that. It really helped me a lot. Tell us about one of the hymns or more of the hymns that were inspirational to you. I uh, anticipated that you might ask that. So I I uh, uh, did a little bit of uh, looking into it. Send the Light was one. And of course, here's Brittany in New York. Mm -hmm. So here's the, here's the verse, one verse. There's a call comes ringing or the restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. Send the light, send the light. That's yeah. all I needed. You know, that's all she needed. She was getting off work uh, in the uh, Jacob uh, Javits Center and she was getting off work. She was coming outside and all of the people uh, in the apartments were, had their windows open and they were, they were cheering the nurses on because they were getting off their shift. And then she came home and she would have this just one verse and I would send her one, one verse every night. And this is what she had. Uh, I'll give you another one. 
Um, my heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my aim, my prayer is higher ground. Mm. And so that's, you know, that's that's how I got through. And, and I wanted to relay that to my granddaughter, too. Amazing. So Brittany is your granddaughter? Yes. Your granddaughter uh -huh. who was working in New York City during the time of the pandemic? Yes, she was in the Naval, uh, uh, the Navy uh, course, the Naval course of, of uh, nurses. And so that's why she was there. She was called, called to do that. You must have been scared to death for her that she was dealing with this unknown disease at the time. You know, we were, but at the same time, we just had so much around us and hearing so much all over that I don't think I focused so much on her, but it was just, it was just the general, generally difficult time in our community right here and around. So um, it's after, it's always yeah. after. Yeah. Then you zero in and you think, what have I just seen? Right. And uh, so I've done that over and over in my life. How was she doing after dealing with all of the death and suffering that she had to deal with during that difficult time? She was a trauma nurse in the hospital. So she had seen this over and over again. And surprisingly, she has adjusted quite well. Uh, in fact, now she is teaching others, other nurses and ENT uh, people uh, to get ready for any kind of combat or anything that has to, comes their way. So she's the teacher. So she got, she went from there to teaching. So Amazing. that's good. Yes. Well, she learned in a very difficult classroom, yes. which is the front lines of a pandemic uh, in the hits, one of the cities hit hardest, New York City. So oh, yes. amazing. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. Tell us why you decided to write this book. I wanted to sum up. I have written several books and I wanted to sum up the the highlights of, of what I had learned and put it all into one book. That's the reason for this. Mm -hmm. um, I. I believe that uh, if you look back through my writing, I have been, I have the stair steps to this book. You can yeah. see it. And so I just wanted to put it all together. I wanted to have it all in one spot. So that's, that when was the reason. When you wanted to put together all you've learned, what have you learned? Well, I have learned that you, I have learned that I can rely on Jesus as my guide. Mm -hmm. and that he is who he said he was and is, and that he's going to do everything he says he's going to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the bottom line. So I really don't need to rely anywhere else. I don't need to look at anything else. Yeah. And um, I wanted to put that for younger people, all of my grandchildren, my, you know, all the people in the neighborhood, all of the young people, I want them to, get something from someone who's gone through some difficult times. Tell us about some of the challenges you faced and how your faith shielded you. Well, when I, uh, when I start this journey in the book, the first one, my father was found dead mm -hmm. uh, at 55, uh, mm -hmm. had been working overtime that, that week, so was not ill at all, and mm -hmm. I was 30. Wow. And it, it absolutely, it absolutely just destroyed me. It really yeah. did. For two years, I was not functioning well. And all I had was little, uh, a couple of little uh, uh, poems. I put them in here so you could see those. That's yeah. all I had, really. Yeah. And just a lifetime of hearing elders talk, but still, I didn't have it. So then, in only five years, I had a 14 year old who was diagnosed with leukemia. Hmm. And then eight more years later, I had another child who was diagnosed with a benign brain tumor that was changing. Hmm. So, so that was kind of my steps um, that we take through the book. Yeah. And, um, and then, and then to top these things, these, these children live, by the way, I need to say that quickly. Thank God. So everyone can, yes. Um, but to top that, I had one after another, I had six family members that are 
pretty close, who died of pancreatic cancer, mm. all of them. So we had all of this going on through those years. So that's kind of um, my school, <laughs> my school mm. learning, my classroom learning. And then mm. um, it, with each one of these, I would just, I would always go toward God. I would always, I had learned that as a young child, I would always, um, I would always rely on him. I, I, and, and by, and I need to say how I did that. Mm -hmm. I would talk with him. I walk with him. I talk with him. Mm -hmm. That's the way, I mean, we just friends, you know, just like friends, uh, not a formal prayer, but just talk with him. Mm -hmm. And so that's the way I got through it. That's the way I walked through. Yeah. It. Now you embrace God and you embraced your faith during these difficult times two children who are sick at a young age, a dad who died at a young age. Some people turn against God during these times. They're like, why me? Why would you do this to me, God? They get angry. How was it that you were able to maintain and forge a positive relationship with your savior when other people seem to lash out? Yes, our, our doctor, uh, the doctor in charge of this first child said 95% of the parents in this situation will not be together when you get through it. Yeah. So, so he said, you need to know this right off. And um, so it, it was true. I saw it. I saw it around me. Um, I think, I think the thing that made me hold on was a strong family be behind yeah. me and forefathers that had been through all of the hardship of, you know, with starting with nothing and building and, mm -hmm. and making their life. I think that helped me the most probably was watching them. But the thing that hurt me the most was, okay, my father died. Other people's father died. My first child. Okay. Other people have illness. It was the second child yeah. that really okay, we've already done this. I've already served. <laughs> I shouldn't be doing this again. So that was, that was the hard, that was the hard one yeah. because I wanted to talk specifics here. I wanted some more specifics on this. And, uh, but uh, thankfully that changed quickly. And I explained that in here. Um, I was sitting in the hospital the night of his uh, brain surgery and I was sitting by the by the um, heliport, and I just had this little little picture postcard of mm -hmm. the heliport at Methodist Hospital. Yeah. And I was sitting there and was watching the the uh, emergency landings of the helicopter into mm -hmm. the hospital. And of course, this went on for hours and hours. And while I was watching that, I was just thinking of God as the as the, the lighthouse, you know, the big beacon that comes off of Methodist Hospital. Mm -hmm. And then these little twitching lights all the way around was us, you know, and we're just we're just here. We're just hoping for for some kind of a, a message from him or for some kind of insight. And so that really was um, beneficial in a very odd way because I just happened to be on that floor beside that heliport. So mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but uh I believe that God knows that he knew mm -hmm. I was going to be in that window at that time. And I believe that, uh, uh, he had something to tell me and he told me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. God works in strange ways, as they say, and his message is delivered in unusual ways. Of course, were both of your children sick at the same time? Uh, the, the first child was 14. He was in remission by the time the 19-year-old, the second child, was 19 and in college. And uh, uh, we were doing all kinds of different tests on him because we couldn't figure out what was going on. And the, the final test then came at Methodist Hospital with the, um, with the uh, uh, discovery of a large benign brain tumor, uh, inoperable. And... Um, and, but changing, but beginning to change, it was beginning to uh, set up uh, what he thought was going to be paralysis. So we had to have the surgery. So 
it was supposed it could not be taken out, but it could be shunted. Hmm. And that's so that's what we did. Amazing. Amazing. So yes. clinic day was Tuesday. Was that for both your yes. children used to go yes, on? Yes, both. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. I don't know if it's true for most uh, uh, people in that situation, but it seemed like Tuesday is the day that we always went. And that's where we got our news. And, uh, you know, it was amazing. There were times when when I would um, I would be absolutely beside myself driving down the road, going, taking the boys, you know, to, mm. to the hospital. And there would be all kinds of distractions that would be funny or there would be uh, uh, a time when I could just pull up to the front door and had parking spots waiting for me, you yeah. know, everything was just fine. And then sometimes it would be something that was funny. And one time I, I kind of avoided a, a car and went off in the ditch and went around here and went around, went around the other way. And it was so funny yeah. that we laughed all the way to the hospital. So those kinds of distractions were always there. And those are God. Yeah. I mean, that isn't something, something that we conjure up or something somewhat that has to be divine. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. It's amazing that you can find levity, you can find humor, you can find laughter, even in dark moments like going to the uh, hospital or the doctor for treatment of a dreaded disease. Um, but uh, it must have been an incredible time. You must have felt like you were going through this unbelievable odyssey. One child sick, you get him through that. He's finally in remission. Now you have another child who's sick. Yes. Yes, it was that. That was a low point. That was a very low point. Yes, because yeah. it didn't seem um, it, it took really 13 years with the boys uh, illnesses. And then the the five or six years around my father's passing. And that was such a, you know, a yeah. hard time. So it took the, that time. And I was thinking, this just doesn't seem right. It just doesn't yeah. seem possible. And other people would not be in this situation. Yeah. Well, when I got to age 56, I started writing. Mm -hmm. I started. Now I had been teaching mm -hmm. in college. I've been teaching in high school, been teaching in college, um, and I'd been teaching writing, but I hadn't been writing my own mm -hmm. uh, books. And um, so that's that's what when I started, 50, age 56. Tell us a little bit about your writing career. You mentioned this is one of several books you've published. Tell us about your first book and how that all got started. Well, the first book came out of that those two boys because mm -hmm. everybody who's, who taught with me in school, everybody around me said, you have got to write a book. Yeah. So the first book was A Whirlwind's Breath. I thought that was an appropriate name yeah. for, the, for the book age 56. That's when I wrote it. The next book was The Amber Necklace, and it was a, a Christmas story for women. Mm -hmm. uh, just basically, it was a Christmas story, a little little storybook. Then Picnic on the Grounds, I was saying that Jesus is our picnic on the grounds. Mm -hmm. He is our special, he is our special, special time, uh, summer and winter, no matter whether it's picnic in the winter too. Then I wrote a journal for girls. I have four granddaughters. So I wrote a journal for girls and I put a prompt at the top for them to write, to mm -hmm. give them an idea, you know, so they could write. Uh, then I wrote Swing Low and that came after my mother's death. And that was one of the pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm telling you uh, that unbelievable that there were all of these uh, these people in my family, my grandmother, my aunt, my mother, my first cousin my gr grandfather on the other side and another cousin. So mm. all of these, all of these people, pancreatic cancer. So I wrote swing low after that. And then I wrote this book Sunday when Sunday looks like Tuesday. And mm. I felt like I was pulling a lot of this together in mm -hmm. this book. Then I wrote three books with other people. Mm -hmm. I, I wrote their story. They gave me their story and I wrote it. And these are all ISBN number books. Uh, Windows of Assurance is a niece uh, by marriage of uh, Johnny Cash, uh, Billy mm -hmm. Cash. She's done a lot of writing and a lot of speaking all over. Um, it was a wonderful experience to write with her. And then uh, Betty Hendon was uh, uh, from Memphis, a, an educator, and she wrote about looking in the rearview mirror the night that uh, Martin Luther King uh, 
was assassinated mm. and seeing the city on fire, basically. And that's called The Bridge. And then I wrote about um, with a, a Dr. George Rawls in Indianapolis. He's a dean of medicine. And he wrote, Papa, I want to be a surgeon. Mm. So those books are all ISBN books. And I have those, um, uh, of course, available. Then, then I have other books that are not do not have that number. Mm. I wrote a, a book about our family that has a French connection. Mm. I wrote a book about a man who started a, a veneer company in Indiana on 66 cents. Mm -hmm. And he just passed this, uh, this uh, uh, Christmas in December. But he is well known all over uh, for doing veneer in some very famous uh, buildings and so on. On 66 cents, he started. Wow. And then I uh, I wrote a Bible study, The Reason for My Hope. It's a Bible study. But these are not ISBN numbers, so they're not in stores. And then I wrote a collection of essays, about 100 pages of that, and it's bound. And then I have several volumes of uh, poetry that I have not done anything with. Mm. The poetry came out of some of this um, some of these hard times too, you know. You have a couple so, of poems in uh, Sunday Looks Like Tuesday, right? Yes, I think I do. I can't. I can't remember how um, if I got those in or not. But I do have. Um, I do have several. These poems were not. No, these poems were not mine. They did not come from me. Okay. I have Normal Day. I love this one. You one want to read day, it to us? Yes, one day I shall dig my fingers into the earth or bury my face in the pillow or stretch myself taunt or raise my hands to the sky and want more than all the world your return. Normal day. Hmm. Beautiful. We all know. We all know about that. You just want a and normal then, day. You just want a day that's not filled with drama, not filled with suffering, well, pain, doctors, all that stuff, right? Yes. And of course, you know, sometimes we think we're bored, but we aren't. <laughs> we aren't. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. So you've been a, you're a very prolific writer. Uh, you're very busy with that. When did you start tapping into that part of your brain? Did it start with your work as a teacher and educator? Yes, it really did. I just didn't have time because I didn't have time to do my own writing because I was uh, that was in an era when we did not uh, uh, do very much with computers. Right. And so most of mine was hard, was a hard copy hand. The blue <laughs> books. Typed, you know, those and kinds the of things. And the uh, typed essays, yeah. Yes, I was write, reading all of that. So I yeah. didn't have time. And then I opened a, a little writing center for seven years in our town here. Wow. And that was, that was watching other people. So then I started to write. I, yeah. I decided to. Amazing. Now, since you've got such a great body of uh, work out there and literary work, let's say a Hollywood director came to you, a producer came to you, wanted to turn one of your books into a movie. Which one would you choose and why? Um, I... I probably would the, the the whirlwind's breath. I probably would because those two stories are so so much in the era when we were beginning to sur the children were beginning to survive leukemia, mm. and uh, and then to have uh, have the other child ill at the same time. I think I would use that one. Yeah. Yes. Because How are you boys doing all these years later? Fine. Yes. Fine. They're both, they're both, uh, uh, in business. They, they're both working in business and, uh, the oldest, the, the 14 year old is, will be 60 this wow. July. Yes. Wow. And, and the, the 19 year old then is two and a half years younger. So, I mean, they're coming along, they're doing well. They're very, very, uh, busy with all of their, the younger boy is, uh, involved more with promotions and that kind of thing so he's helped me today to prepare Wonderful. and then um my older boy is with uh is in finance mainly uh working in computers and finance so. well it's great to hear that they're doing well after having such a uh, difficult time of it in their formative years um to challenge for you of course 
but it's a challenge for them. They're the ones going through it. So uh, thank God they did get through it. You're a very, a person filled with faith. Are you involved in a church or is faith something more personal to you? Tell us a little bit about your spiritual life. I, I'm in, always, I've always been in church. I always gravitate toward church and I always, I always go with the anticipation that I'm going to get a message for that next week because it's going to be hard. <laughs> There'll be something, there'll be something I'm sure. So I always look at it that way. Um, that isn't the end all though, mm -hmm. you know, but that's part of it. It's part of it. And it can be disappointing sometimes, you know, you think you're going to get something from the church that maybe you didn't, but, oh, you really do need others with yeah. you, you know, to help out. And uh, so, yes, I, I'm very active in the church. That's great. They, uh, being part of a spiritual community is important. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, obviously it goes beyond services. Like you said, it's the actual community that's there to support you. Was it helpful when your children were sick? Were people helping you with meals, maybe that kind of stuff? Uh, we did have, um, yes, we did have a, a lot of, uh, a lot of help, but everyone was afraid. I mean, everyone knew that the first one was going to die. Mm. I had, um, I had, through my training in school and so on, I had a principal, I had a little two-year-old, I had, I mean, I had a list of all the people that I watched die of leukemia. I had mm. all of that in my mind. Well, everyone else did too. So they just really didn't know so much then what to do. I think today we're in better shape uh, yeah. with that. I think people are more organized in the church to, to have campaigns and, and uh, bring food and, and do those kinds of things. But we just, everyone was really afraid. Yeah, absolutely. So, what years was this that uh, your boys were sick? Okay, 78 was the year that this, I've got to give you this context. We had the James Jones, Guyana tragedy. Yep. In our neighborhood, we had the Burger Chef murders. Mm -hmm. All of this in this week, all of this on television. And of course, when you're in the hospital, you're watching television. All of this was on television. Right. It was November 1978. Yeah. So we... It was um, it was a really difficult time nationally, locally, ever in every way. Yeah. And of course, seventy eight was uh, in the Midwest was the the blizzards that just just yeah. shut everything down. So yeah, we got those blizzards in the Northeast as well. I remember yeah. the uh, summer of seventy eight very very well. I was sixteen years old, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and your your boy was about the same age, right? Yes, he was. Yeah. He went on a trip with his little friend across the United States and uh, uh, just really had a, had a good time and uh, kept getting more pale all the time. Mm. And we kept watching. And then he tried out for uh, football. He was in middle school, uh, in the, later in middle school. And he, um, he, he was on the football team. So when he went in, for his initial uh, diagnosis, yep. he was on a football team. Wow. So the doctor said, oh, we have a good body to work with here. <laughs> He's good and strong. He, he said, we have something good to work with here. Well, so. well thank God he was strong yes. for that. Before we leave you today, I just want to ask you, what is the message that you hope viewers take away from and readers take away from the book when Sunday looks like Tuesday? I want them to... to uh, not be afraid to to rely on Jesus as a a savior in every way, even saving time, even saving saving you in in or everyday life. Hmm. But a savior who what he said he was going to do, he's going to do, and just lean into that and rest. I had, when I uh, autographed this book, I always put the passage in Matthew that says, lean into me, you know, to rest, come yeah. to me and rest. That's Wonderful. what I want people to, to have. And rest is what people need when they're going through hard times. Oh, yes. They need that peace. They need that solace. They need that comfort for sure. Judy Chatham is an amazing author, a prolific author, and her 
One of her latest books is truly a remarkable book, a very inspirational book. It is called When Sunday Looks Like Tuesday, Growing a Strong Faith for Everyday Living. We will discover within the pages of this book, Judy's journey that will inspire you to help you build resilience, to overcome life's trials, and have unwavering faith. Judy, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.